around 60% of all the cocoa comes from Western Africa. In Western Africa, you have 2 million farmers and 1.6 million children working on these farms. And if you know that 1.6 million children are working in, uh, in these farms, of which 500,000 people are illegally working, and we call them slaves, um, uh, and the world calls them worst forms of child labor. And it sounds arrogant, it sounds naive, but I honestly mean and I think that a company can change the whole sector. And if you as a company can change the whole sector, then there's something going on. Then there is a deeper goal in just earning money. Het uh, sustainable karakter, dat spreekt me erg aan. Het groen. En dat had in Amsterdam veel eerder moeten gebeuren. De eerste taxi, elektrische taxi, die reed rond in Amsterdam in 1909. Geloof het of niet. <laughs> dus het heeft 100 jaar en nog een beetje geduurd voordat we tot dit concept nu komen in Amsterdam. Dus dat is wel vele jaren te laat. That I start working in the financial sector for a private equity firm. Um, and, and basically what I saw and, and what we learned at school was that everyone has to follow his own interest and try to maximize his profits. And then they said that's good for everyone. And I did this for four years, and, uh, but I could only conclude that this was of course not the case. So I figured out that I had to do something else. And uh, that's why we started Taxi Electric. And, and the main reason to start a company was just proving that you can do business in a different way. No one can be proud when he is uh, empty, fishing, overfishing the seas. No one can be proud when he is working proactively in deforestation. No one can be proud working at Shell. Yet, most of us do this kind of jobs. We know it's wrong, still we're doing it. I think it's a waste of our time and a waste of basically our lives. There are more and more companies thinking about what is our role for society, what's our value add to society. Not only making money for ourselves, but, but how does society benefit from us? Sustainability is, is, is not a destination. Sustainability is a trajectory. You can never say, I made it, because you can always improve. To put it in a bigger perspective, for me, social entrepreneurs are showing us a new economy. For me, it's an economy that's about value, that's about value creation for society, and uh, not just about financial value, which what we tend to think about if we talk about the economy now, and I believe we need to go through a system where the economy is about value and where we create profit for everyone in that community. And I think the social entrepreneurs are the perfect examples of being able to create value for everyone. I think many commercial organizations that we're dealing with have gone beyond the traditional CSR, which was seen as tokenistic, by actually having a company that cares and deals with the environment and with society and with communities um, uh, better. So maybe one of the significant impacts of social enterprise will be to change the way that the commercial sector works. And I've always said that what we need is a socially enterprising economy, not loads of social enterprises. I think there are some fantastic social enterprises, capital S, capital E. There are a lot of crap ones um, as well. And there are a lot of people pretending they have an enterprise when they don't. Um, so I'm interested in how we create uh, an economy that is socially enterprising. How do we incentivize uh, uh, SMEs, for example, to take long-term unemployed people on. I would have thought through the tax system. What really changes things is if you can shift the market, because businesses trade uh, in response to a market. And so if the market demands that businesses are being much more socially and environmentally responsible, then businesses will become more socially and environmentally responsible. This is why the Social Value Act is fundamentally a game changer. Because what's not to love about this notion that you reward businesses for doing the right thing? I mean, this is not rocket science. This is remarkable. This is kind of, you know, this is the definition of common sense. So I think that with regards to the social enterprise movement is we're at the end of the beginning, you know, uh, uh, and I think the next chapter will be as equally interesting and probably tougher. Um, in regards to how things scale, where the capital comes from uh, uh, for that, and where the talent and leadership is going to come from in order to um, bring great ideas to, you know, really big impact in the world. These people, 
I've never really had a proper job, something that I like doing, you know. I started drinking a lot and uh, got in trouble with the police. Michael came to us about almost two years ago now, when I first started almost, and basically he had just come out of prison. And I realised this guy really has a talent. And then when he got the job at the Savoy, that was just like icing on the cake, really. My name's David Sterling. I got made homeless, lost my house and everything. And we've worked with over 500 homeless people here. We've employed 70 as apprentices in three years. And that's not been an easy journey. Just running a business is often a challenge. Um, trying to make sure that you've got a really good uh, social impact as well can make it hard. It all depends on the, the design of the social business, how quickly they are successful, how much impact they have. Social enterprises have that tough balancing act. You know, do you lead with the business? Do you lead with the social mission and the impact? I will say it has to be with the business. And I've done it both ways, and I've got the scars to prove it. If you're saying, you know, uh, you're a cafe, for, for an example, and you give them a lousy cup of coffee, and then you tell them that, that you're helping to train them to be a barista, well, that's no good to that customer. People buy your product because it's a good product. And that should be your aim. But in addition, say not only is a good product, it's also a social business. That should be an additional thing. I sell a crappy product, but I said, please help us because we are a social business. That will be very sloppy social business. So I get worried that people think that because they're doing something for a good cause, that that's somehow enough to be a substitute for quality. It isn't. In a way, sometimes you feel that you have to prove yourself a bit more because you are a social business. If you're setting up a social business, look at your industry, look at your competitors, and first and foremost, try and be better than them. We're not asking someone, shop with us through sympathy. We're saying, shop with us, it's the same quality, if not better than Pret, and you're helping others. But it's really important that there's no compromise. You know, the staff have got to be better, the quality's got to be better. You might get the sympathy purchase once, but you won't get it twice. And any business needs customers that, that keep coming back. How you market your product is extremely important. Um, how you balance, uh, of course, the, the, the basics of the quality of your product and the pricing, but also how do you balance the social mission and how you sell this to the public. Some organisations have outstanding success by putting their social mission loud and proud and upfront, and others have outstanding success by making sure that it's discreet. It depends entirely on the product, it depends on the market niche. There is no right answer to this. When anyone gets served, they get a loyalty card that gives them a half price lunch on their fifth visit and free on their tenth, but also tells them a bit about the social motivations. We want to try and inform people of what we're all about, but ultimately I think a lot of customers come in because it's good food and it's good service and all the usual things you would expect. The quality and, and the, the principle behind it are both equally important, so yeah, I'll definitely be back. <laughs> We wanted to make a chocolate bar that has the story intrinsic inside. So the bar is unequally shared, like the world is unequally shared. And you get letters from moms, they say, just before the soccer training, I gave two pieces of chocolate to, to the kids and I had to explain the fact that the world is unequally shared because your bars are unequally shared. Okay, so it's number one, just lekker. And that it's eerlijk is, that people in Ghana also an eerlijke prijs krijgen. So that is an extra erbij. And that works then in zekere zin ook wel om het gewoon te blijven gebruiken. So I think the way that Brigade write it on their menu that, you know, this is what we do, but here is our social ambition. Because you, you'll come to a restaurant, you'll spend a bit of time looking at the menu, looking at the drinks menu. I think it's great when you interact with it quite naturally in a way that's not too forceful. Having that extra story and knowing the story behind it, I think it's going to subconsciously, at least for someone like me, is going to draw me in even more now, definitely. I would definitely feel that like something that has some meaning behind it is definitely a reason I would suggest it to a friend. It's also super stylish and I'd totally wear it to school or out with friends. I think it's very important that Taxi Electric tells exactly what they are doing and uh, they don't have to scream it, but they can let it a little bit more talent to the world because storytelling is very popular nowadays and they have a very good story. We, we can talk a lot more about our story and then when we are doing it, we start telling it. 
And I think this is also really important because what I see a lot is that people that set, set a really ambitious sustainable goal or a really ambitious social goal, and then they go to the press and they're going to tell everyone about it, and then they fail. And, and this is, I think, really bad marketing for, for I, we call it the bright side of the economy, because people get start, stop believing these stories, of course. I think there's also a difference when we spoke, speak about B2B or B2C um, uh, markets, as where B2B, it seems more difficult to put the social mission on the forefront. With regards to our commercial customers, in truth, we found if we didn't tell them we were a social business, and just dealt with them on commercial terms. And after we created a successful relationship with them, they could see the benefits of working with a social business. It's important that they trust us from the commercial side, so they need to be very careful before they engage us because if we didn't do that job properly, then they could be damaged to their brand as well. Yeah, corporates in, in, let's say, the su supplier side can mean a lot for social entrepreneurs, potentially, but you see that all social entrepreneurs struggle to actually make that happen. The advice I can give, make sure as a social entrepreneur, and th that needs a lot of sort of preparation and how you do it, but sit at the table with the CEO. That's where change is happening. And secondly, explain well to uh, your, also the price of your service or product, but also about the social impact you're actually making and, and preferably try to measure it. You don't need to write a whole report of 100 pages about your impact, but tell the story because that's what differentiates you. Uh, and that means, of course, when you can bring along that, that differentiator, uh, it could mean that your price could be slightly higher. My, my view is that if you trade on being the cheapest in the marketplace, then by default your margins are going to be very low and you would always be looking to save costs. So I think it would be very difficult to have that model to work in our environment because we wouldn't be generating sufficient surpluses to reinvest in the social side. There's lots of money in the world, you've just got to be smart enough to work out where it is and it's probably not going to be on your doorstep. I think traditionally social enterprises have operated in areas of market failure Increasingly, I would say to social enterprises, follow the money. And it's kind of a Robin Hood economics model, I guess. If you go into the markets where there are high margins and high profits, and you take those for social benefit and for social good, then the impact you can have can be absolutely massive. Social enterprises, some of them are always going to have higher costs and lower productivity. So we have this blended income stream model we will be running this on a, a mix of funding. There'll be sales income. There's a bit of philanthropy here. There's uh, some uh, grants because we've been rehabilitating an old building. Um, there's also, of course, training allowances for youngsters who have been out of work. So this, this idea of blending your income together to make something sustainable is often what makes or breaks a, you know, a successful social enterprise.